Assalamu alaikum. I am Sayyid Mansur Ali Shah, a judge at the Supreme Court of Pakistan. I was earlier the Chief Justice at the Lahore High Court in Punjab. And I say that because I'll be sharing with you some of the judicial reforms we carried out in Punjab. Let me say that I really wanted to be with you today personally, but due to my judicial commitments, I could not travel. So my apologies, but inshallah, there'll be other moments and occasions when you all get to meet. Let me start off by saying that it's a privilege and honor to be having this conversation with the Dil community. I've had the opportunity of visiting your offices in Islamabad and having looked at some of the work being done. It's very impressive and the honor is all mine in having this conversation with you. It's interesting that a judge has been asked to speak on the subject of uh, education and children. One would have thought that there could have been other more appropriate people to attain to the subject. But uh, on, upon reflection, I thought that's not that bad a choice. I could bring in the concept of justice into the equation. And to me, the equation is uh, children, education, and a strong, progressive, peaceful, and tolerant Pakistan. So in the next couple of minutes, let me share with you some of the dimensions of the concept of justice. Let me begin by saying that uh, Pakistan is a constitutional democracy, as you already know, and we have a rich history in constitutionalism. Our very founder of the nation, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, was a constitutionalist. The constitution, therefore, is that fundamental and foundational construct on which the nation stands. It is the supreme document that governs us and gives us the guidance into the future. So what are those core principles that come out of our constitution? And they are principles of democracy, freedom, equality, tolerance, social, economic and political justice. So when we talk about principles of democracy, we talk about access to facilities, we talk about meritocracy, and when we talk about access to facilities, we include education in it. When we talk about freedom, we talk about the right to have choices and the right to have a choice to education rather than child labor. When we talk about equality, it means that everybody has a right to education. You can't discriminate on the basis of background, on the basis of financial positions. No, you can't. So everybody has to be equal. Everybody has to have education. When you talk about tolerance, we're saying we create a space where everybody comes together, irrespective of their background, religion, or race. We're talking about a society which is inclusive. We're talking about a society which is plural in its character. All this put together leads to social, economic, and political justice. And this is what our constitution mandates. Article 11 of the constitution, which is a fundamental right, says that no child below the age of 14 would be put to hazardous employment. And I think domestic worker, to my mind, passes the test of hazardous employment. So it's a fundamental right of a child not to be put to work under the age of 14. Article 25A, recently introduced into our constitution, says that the state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children of the age of 5 to 16 years. This is a fundamental right. Everybody has a right to education between that age group. So, as I see it at a national level, we need to get our children back into school. If we're talking about 70 million children, 60% of so are in schools, the others are not. And the children who are out of school is a staggering figure, and probably at, even at the international level, it's a staggering figure. So we need to work on that, we need to curb child employment. So let's just begin by defining what justice means. Justice actually means to put everything in its right place. So in layman's language, to be just, to be fair, to be equitable, to be impartial, to be unbiased, to be unprejudiced, to be non-partisan, to be non-discriminatory, to be objective and to be neutral would be some of the attributes of justice. And coupled with this concept, the concept of compassion and mercy comes in. 
So while we decide cases in accordance with law, we are actually deciding cases by looking at the law and a thing called equity, which is that compassion and mercy that a judge must also have. So when we talk about justice or the concept of justice, we're talking about a just, fair, compassionate and a merciful person. So what we need to do is, and this starts at home, and when I say, if I could, if I could sort of um, coin the new term for you, which is justicizing children. This could begin at home, you see. We need to ensure that our children are just and fair in their thinking, in, their, in, in, in dealing with their matters, in dealing with their friends, in dealing with their school, schools, in dealing with their work and education, in dealing with their affairs, which ought to be tempered with compassion and mercy at the same time. Now this can happen in any home, it can happen in any family. So I think instead of thinking that justice is something that is best left to judges and the courts, that's not the way to look at it. We need to start engendering and embedding justice into the mind of a child at home. And that can only happen if the parents are just, if the parents are fair in their dealings, it will have a major impact on the child. So we start off by saying that if we could justicize children, that's like developing and engendering the concept of justice at the very beginning at home, it will have a far reaching effect on the society eventually. Moving on from the home to the schools, that's perhaps where Dill also comes in. Let's talk about justicizing education. Access to education is very important. We need to open up the access to all sorts of people, subject to, of course, whatever criteria and limitations we have, but access to education has to be there. It's an essential and a just, it's an essential component of a just society that you have access to education, that everybody has access to education. So children should not be discriminated and everybody deserves a right to come to school. The second component regarding justicizing education could be that the schools inculcate a sense of justice. Now that can happen if the school, the entire system at the school is just and fair. The teachers are just and fair in their dealings with the students or amongst themselves. And there is a culture of fairness and justice in the system. And I think I'm quite sure that's how they'll functions. So having a, a non-discriminatory, transparent and inclusive and compassionate policy would have a bearing on the children who are studying at the school. So the schools need to underline the importance of plurality, inclusiveness, gender sensitivity, ethics and values and interfaith harmony. All these are offshoots of a just and fair society. And teachers ought to be embodiments of fairness. Their everyday dealing with the children must demonstrate fairness. No one can bend the rules. Rule of law is supreme. These are the kind of values we need to engender in the children. Then coming to children with different abilities, they enjoy the same constitutional right like the other children. But we don't see children with different abilities being mainstreamed in regular schools. And this is a major dilemma Pakistan faces. I would hope and urge Dil to consider this dimension. We need to bring in children who can possibly, who have different abilities to come into mainstream schooling. This would not only help them understand, become function well, but also the other children would understand how, what compassion is all about, what caring for others is all about. This is creating a just atmosphere. This is creating a very tolerant atmosphere when we start looking after others. So I think a dimension which really needs attention is that children with different abilities need to be embraced and brought into the system. Then we need to also talk about, when we talk about education, perhaps just education or fair, bringing fairness into education would also involve that the schools must have vocational, the facility of having vocational training or 
some sort of an entrepreneurial skills be developed amongst children. Maybe they cannot continue education, but they could fend for themselves later on by developing a certain skill set. So it would be important to look at the curriculum with that kind of fairness and justness that they don't need to only get degrees. They could develop into more vocational students or carry out certain entrepreneurial abilities so they can start off with life as they come out of schools. We need to also look at the fact that we need to start empowering children. The children must be made aware of their rights. They should understand what abuse is all about. They should understand what bullying is all about. They must have access to helplines. They might have access to support networks, who to reach out to, the kind of abuse that takes place at schools and the informal madrasas. We need to attend to that also. And that would be creating a, a just and fair educational system or we would be justicizing education with these elements that I've just shared with you. Moving on to from home to school and now moving on to the justice sector, how do we look at children and education as, as a court system or as a justice sector? Let me say that uh, the, role, the role of the courts has been over the years and all over the world that of parents, you see, as the, the term loco parentis, I'm sure you're aware of that. We enjoy a parental jurisdiction over children. So, Every time we dispense justice, our just jurisprudence is replete with uh, case law which bends in favor of the children. We have to look at, whenever we're deciding a matter, the welfare of the child is supreme. While deciding a family matter, a guardianship matter, the, the interest or the welfare of the child is supreme. So the courts are naturally bent towards the children and they favor children and they look after them. Similarly, we have laws that look support children and for example, the entire juvenile justice system says that if a child commits a crime, then there is no capital offense for the child and there are other facilities in the system for the child. We also have schooling in the prisons for the child. Uh, so the whole legal system has a reformative touch to it. The idea is to get the child out into uh, real life as soon as possible so he's reformed and he can stand on his feet. So the justice system as such is geared towards supporting and protecting and safeguarding the interests of children. Let me also say that uh, while in Lahore when I was there as the Chief Justice we carried out certain reforms and I'm very happy to share them with you. We came up with the child court for the first time and I don't think there is an example of that in Pakistan as yet. There's a child court and the concept behind child court was that while, as, as you're all aware, that uh, justice uh, cases in the court system take years and years to be decided. So we thought if there's a case that involves a child, he could be a party in the case, he could be a witness in the case, or he could be the accused in the case. If he's subjected to the same rigors of uh, litigation, it might take years and years before he leaves the court system. And that will have a major bearing on his life because he's just starting life. So we thought, let's have a child court where we fast track cases relating to children. So if a child in a particular case is a victim or is accused or is a person who is um, a witness, who is a child, we pass that case on to the child court which purely functions on a very fast track basis. And the idea is to get the child out of the court system as soon as possible with the decision. Similarly, we've set up a uh, gender-based violence courts. Now these courts would deal with cases which relate to gender violence. It could be rape, it could be uh, you know, household uh, beating or child abuse, a number of those cases. We've tried to bring them into gender-based violence court and these courts are separated, physically separated from the general court systems so that the child is kind of protected when he's passing through uh, these uh, the, the court so that he's not affected by the larger court structure and the court systems. The other importance is that in a normal court, you have a court which is jam-packed with all sorts of people looking at you while you're even deposing as a, as a witness. So imagine a child who is a young girl who's been raped and she's a rape victim standing in the court deposing and all sorts of people in a jam-packed court are looking at her 
and the kind of questions that are being asked by the lawyer, it could be extremely humiliating. So the new child court and the gender-based violence court creates that atmosphere. It totally changes the ambience of the court. You could just have one trial in a courtroom at that time. The victim has a choice to be sitting in a room next door and recording her deposition through a video system, or she could be sitting in the courtroom with a shield in front of her so that she doesn't, she's protected from the gazes of the public. And nobody can be, no can be, nobody can be in the courtroom except the parties that are dealing with this case. Now this has uh, developed, this has encouraged a lot of young people and parents to bring in their cases to the courts because who were earlier shied away because of the atmosphere of the court and it was so embarrassing and humiliating to come to court have now started coming to the courts and uh, you know seeking justice against the whoever is the perpetrator. So we're very proud of the fact that we have the child courts and we have the gender-based violence courts. We've also established a new concept which is not new in the world but new for us which is mediation, an alternative dispute resolution. We've tried to encourage that also for, not for everybody, but also for children, where we would want that matters pertaining to children could be mediated as soon as possible and we leave the court system so that they get decided and children could leave the court system as soon as possible. So the idea and the focus has been to create a protective environment for the children because they can't be put through the rigors of this court structure in their formative years if they happen to be for some reason in the court system, their cases ought to be decided as soon as possible and off they go into the real world and they can get back to and get, get started with their lives. So with the child court, with the gender-based courts, with the new ADR system, we are trying to encourage this new system. We've also come up with a new case management system where we'll be tracking cases for children and we want those cases to be out as soon as possible. And I'm very proud to announce that Zainab's case, which was a, a, a unfortunate and a very gruesome murder that took place, they, they uh, raped a young child actually, and she was then murdered. The case was decided in a very short period of time because of this policy that you've had. And you must have heard about the Zainab's case where the person has now been uh, you know, has, has served as capital punishment. And as a last word, let me just say that um, Let's all get together and produce and nurture wonderful human beings who are fair, who are just, who are compassionate and whose hearts are full of mercy. So good luck. I'm sure we can do this. Khuda Hafiz.